what choices you're making. I, I think having conversations together about what's important to you, the teenager, what's important to me, the parent, and how do we how do we find a way to meet in the middle so that you're getting your needs met? You might not get everything you want. I might not get everything I want, but we get what's needed. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Transformation Through Empowerment. I'm your host, Yogi Patel, and today we have a very special guest with us. We have Ava Dwight, a friend of mine and my colleague from the Positive Discipline Association. She's a trainer, and she specializes in supporting parents through various challenges they have in raising their teenagers, and she works with schools. So Ava, welcome to the show. Thank you. So tell us, before you became a positive discipline trainer, what is it that you did for a living? Well, I started out teaching English and language arts um, to seventh graders. And um, one of my observations about myself is that when I walked in the classroom those first couple of years, I thought I was all about teaching English and reading. And what I realized after I got to the point where I was really building relationship with my students and and caring about them on a personal level, what I recognized is that I'm not here to teach English. I'm here to teach kids. And that really changed the focus of who I was being in the classroom. And it helped me move from a person with no self, no classroom management skills at all, because I really didn't have any. I was not good at classroom management, to a person who could connect with students And the classroom management came along because I had connection with students. And so that wasn't taught to me in my um, teacher prep program. It was something I had to just kind of figure out. And it took me a few years to to get there. But when I did, um, it made such an impact in my teaching. And so I I was happily going along teaching and then um, decided to make a shift to the the counseling department. So I got my master's degree in educational counseling and uh, moved, actually I got lucky because there was an opening in in the school where I was working and I really loved that school. So I got to shift from being an English language arts teacher to being a counselor at that school. So I was a teacher for 12 years and then I was a counselor for 20 years here in, in Mesa, Arizona in our public school system. And then I retired from the school system in 2018. And along the way, <clears throat> I um, I had children after I'd been teaching. I was 30 when my older son was born. So I'd been teaching for about eight years. So I had kind of made that transformation in, into who I wanted to be as a teacher. And then when my son was two, my mom, who was a music teacher, had to take a continuing ed course. And um, she happened to sign up for this class called Positive Discipline. And she brought me the original book by Jane Nelson. And, and she said, he's turning two. I think this would be a really helpful book. This was a great training, and I wish I had had it when you were growing up. And so I I read the book, and it really spoke to who I had become as a teacher and who I wanted to be as a parent. So my husband and I started embracing positive discipline concepts and tools in a more formal way, but but really our understanding at that that stage was pretty superficial. Um, but but we were using those skills as, as best we could and getting really good results. And so um, I, along the way, I met this amazing woman named Dodie Blomberg, who is actually now a positive discipline lead trainer. We live around the corner from each other. Our kids are the same age. She had been using positive discipline in the classroom and then found out that you could, by the way, get trained to teach parenting classes in this stuff. And I was like, well, really, tell me more. So at that point, she had already become certified. So I took her certification class for parenting classes and started teaching um, parenting classes at my school in 2008 and then um, applied to be teaching them at the district level. We have a district-wide program for parents in about 2012. And then along the way also, I took Dodie's training for positive discipline in the classroom. So by the time I got that far with the classroom certification, I was a counselor and I just started using, you know, I was using them in a, a more informal way with the kids I was working with, with the teachers I was um, trying to support. And so in 2018, I, after 32 years, decided I need to step away from the schools. And I really want to take that next step of becoming a trainer. And so I had done the preparation work in that last year 
um, at my school and became a certified trainer in 2018 so that I can offer this work in, in really bigger, more impactful ways than I was only doing classes at the, the school district level. So it's been a journey. I stepped off not knowing exactly what the years would look like. Um, and the last, now it's been five and a half years since I retired from the schools. And I'm just really grateful that I get to do this work with so many parents and so many teachers. Um, really, now that we're doing a lot of our work online, working with people from not just in the US, but around the world. So not in my little microcosm of a community, but in the big macrocosm of the world. Because I think I think positive discipline is life-changing. I know it has been for me, and I think it's world-changing. So that's me in a nutshell. I hope that wasn't too long. Oh, it's just wonderful to hear about you and just the transformation, right? I think things change as we have our children, and then we start to kind of look at the whole education system or the care and nurture from a different perspective. And you spoke a lot about mm -hmm. how you sort of grown as the needs arises and sort of this journey of education is just developing more skills and more interest. And the theme always is supporting children and meeting them, not just intellectually only, but really just connecting with the heart that Positive Discipline speaks about. And what a great resource parents and teachers can have now that you've had this experience both at home and at school. And I'm just grateful to be able to answer some of the questions that parents may already be, you know, have. So I know that my journey is very similar to yours. We both have worked in schools and we both have children and through which we've come through positive discipline. And thank you to your mother-in-law who sort of kind of nudged you in this direction because I just enjoy working with you and what a gift that you offer each day as you provide some of the tools online in your social media. So it's always intriguing and I always an absolutely love listening to the tools. And one of the things that I was thinking about from the perspective of a parent uh, when I raised my children was setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. So how can parents strike the right balance between giving their teenagers independence, which they need, and setting necessary boundaries for safety and their well-being, especially when they're navigating through um, current social media and variety of other things that are in their life. Yeah, so many joys in parenting and so many challenges too. And and social media and some of the pressures that are coming on our kids from the outside world are so much bigger and heavier than when we were going through that stage of life. So I think what, what, what it comes down for me is um, what I tend to refer to as solution-focused conversations with kids. So when we talk about setting boundaries around anything, about technology use, about how late you stay up, about you know what choices you're making. I, I think having conversations together about what's important to you, the teenager, what's important to me, the parent, and how do we how do we find a way to meet in the middle so that you're getting your needs met. You might not get everything you want. I might not get everything I want, but we get what's needed in order to protect the child's safety and also facilitate their growth, right? Because I'm not going to be here hovering on their shoulder as they walk around in life. So I have to be able to um, teach them skills and also give them opportunity to try using those skills out there in the world. And, and that can be a little tension inducing on the parenting end. And I think from the teenage end too, when they're experiencing new things, it's stressful. It's a little scary. And because what, what I think a lot of parents don't realize is that, that our teens tend to get bigger bodies before they get fully developed brains. And that executive functioning system that is our you know frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex, however you refer to that, um, it's not fully developed for young women until they're into their mid-20s and for young men until they're into their late 20s. And so even though our 18, 20, 21-year-olds are, are often looking really mature, and, and especially compared to when they're in early teenager years, boy, there's been a lot of growth and development. And there's a lot more growth and development that happens into those young adult years as well. So it's, for me, a gradual process of saying, okay, I've tried to teach you these skills. What would you do if? I think what if conversations are really important so that we can kind of front load possibilities for our kids because when they don't have a fully functioning executive 
functioning system, and they don't have a lot of life experience. When they go into a stressful situation that's new, you and I looking from the outside in could say, oh, well, I can give you two handfuls worth of things that you could do in that situation. But I'm 59 years old. I got a lot of life experience under my belt. My 14-year-old, my 17-year-old, my my 12-year-old has virtually none. And so if we can kind of front load conversations with what if, what would you do? So that if we've had that conversation and problem solved in advance, hopefully in the moment, part of their brain will revert to that conversation and say, oh, look, I have another choice. What could I do that would keep me safe and, and save face if I need to or whatever? Um, so I think having conversations in little snatches, not long conversations, because with kids, you'll get eye rolling and are we done yet? And, you know, just, just a few minutes. Let's just talk about what if. Um, and and just hypothesize a little bit. And then when we are talking about, okay, here's what you want. Here's what I'm concerned about. What are some possible solutions we could brainstorm to solve this problem? And we're going to write down any ideas that we can think of, silly ideas, cookie ideas, serious ideas. Um, and then we're going to go back through our ideas and say, okay, is there anything here that's not really related to the issue? So a solution should be related. Is there anything here that's not respectful to you and me and anybody else involved in the situation? So related, respectful. Anything here that's not reasonable? I don't, I don't think we can really do that. Okay, cross that off the list. Anything that wouldn't be helpful in solving the problem, cross those off the list. Now, what's left on our list that we could <clears throat> either use individual suggestions or combine suggestions to create a solution that we're both willing to try, and then let's give it a whirl. And let's come back afterwards and say, how did that work? What could work better? What could we try differently next time? And so it's a gradual process of introducing solution-focused thinking and conversation to our kids so that think about all the skills they have as we go through this process of thinking, using criteria that's critical thinking skills um, to eliminate things that aren't going to work, trying something, going back to the drawing board if we need to, trying it again. That's what we all do. That's how we navigate life. So those are really important skills that we're teaching kids at the same time that we're hopefully you know, putting some some boundaries that will keep them safe um, when they're not with us to watch over them. I appreciate exactly what you're saying is finding those times and giving them the what if scenarios and having conversations. Mm -hmm.